with you. We're going to go first in our Bibles to Luke chapter 16. <clears throat> I wanted to talk to you about this. I, I just, I feel led of the Spirit to just talk, I don't know how long, on heaven. I don't mean just today how long, but I mean over the next few weeks. Just to talk about heaven, <clears throat> our home. Our expectation, our longing, I believe we're going there very soon. I believe Jesus is coming soon. If you're going through things like I am, you're probably experiencing a very aggressive work of the devil to try to tie you to this earth, to try to consume you with things here rather than things there. I think that's been a great battle and a struggle. I believe God is freeing us from ourselves, exposing ourselves, wanting us to be more like Jesus I want to talk to you this morning about this, that all roads do not lead to heaven, but they do lead to hell, except one. You know, you always hear all roads lead to heaven, but they don't. They lead to hell. There's only one road that leads to heaven. That's Jesus Christ. It's the only way. There is no other way. There's no other way. There's a cemetery in Indiana. And in that cemetery, there's a tombstone that reads this. It says, pause, stranger, when you pass me by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. Well, somebody reading that made this etching upon that. And they said this, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. (laughs) The question that I want to ask is, can we really know where we're going to go when we die? Can we really know it? You know, you hear a lot of Christians that I do believe are saved constantly battling with the assurance of their salvation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this this morning. Can you really know for sure where you're going when you die? What is the assurance? What is the confidence that we can have that causes us to not waver and gives us peace and gives us rest in that? Now, I'd like for you this morning to be very honest with yourself and God. You don't have to be anything to me or anybody else, but just be honest with God. Whether you have that assurance or not, whether you have the peace or not, listen to what I desire to tell you this morning so that you can have it. One thing is certain in humanity, all humanity, wherever it exists, Something is built into man, all men everywhere, that tells him that we are going somewhere when we die. That's within everyone. Even reincarnationists believe that we're going somewhere, whether we come back here in some other life form, we're going somewhere. We don't cease to exist. And it's been the testimony of many infidels and agnostics and atheists who just believe you're here and when you die it's all over and nothing goes on beyond that. Well, the hypocrisy of their beliefs are testified to on their deathbeds when most of these avowed people who believe nothing happens after you die cried out in horror to God on their deathbed knowing that they were plunging into something very horrible. And so we all know we're going somewhere. The question is where? Are you prepared for that? And you certainly don't want to end up in a place that the Bible refers to as hell If indeed it does exist, you want to be able to escape that and not be there. Various religions around the world teach men that from every culture and ethnic group, that we must prepare ourselves, that there is a God somehow, a higher being, whatever these various religions worship. There is something that we have to answer to. There is this that we have to deal with. C.S. Lewis said this, all your life. An unattainable ecstasy has hovered just beyond the grasp of your consciousness. The day is coming when you will wake to find beyond all hope that you have attained it or else that it was within your reach and you have lost it forever. And it is over. Judging by what's said at most funerals today, you would think that everybody's going to heaven. You would think regardless of how a person has lived or even what a person has believed, You would just hear at funeral services that somehow they all made it. Well, I think about that oftentimes. And I think that either the Bible is the most least understood book in all of the world, or a lot of people are full of audacity to insinuate that the God of the heaven they intend to reach is a liar. Because Jesus himself said that few people will find the way 
that leads to everlasting life. But the majority of people will take the broad way that leads to death. This is something that we must prepare ourselves for today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that God calls out to you. Joshua said, even way back in the Old Testament, you need to choose this day whom you're going to serve. You need to choose. You need to decide. And in that decision, you need to reckon it so and live that. There's a common thread in all of religions, all major religions, I would say. There's a common thread. And the common thread is this, that there is a belief that we have upset the gods, that they're angry somehow, that the gods will judge us if they're not appeased. There is a day of reckoning and there is a chance through sacrifice that somehow the gods can be appeased of their anger that we have caused them. And that is the diligence of religion. That is why you may find some in various religions, I'm, I'm considering Islam right now, how diligent they are at prayer, how diligent they are several times through the day, early in the mornings, to get up, to congregate and meet and pray to Allah because they pray that He will find favor, or they will find favor with Him and He will let them into His kingdom. And they don't know what his mood is like from one particular day to the next or even during the day if he's happy or sad or angry or or whatever. And one minute he may be accepting them and the next minute he's not going to accept them. And and then they say the only surety you have to reach his kingdom is if you die a martyr's death in jihad. And even then, some of them are questioning whether they're going to make it at that point. And so there's confusion in all of the religions, but there's not a confusion in Christianity. Hell is not going to be what it's often portrayed to be in many people's minds in comic strips and in those that jokingly and carelessly talk about it as though it's no big deal. It is a big deal. Hell is a a very real and literal place that I assure you none of you want to end up in. This is something we have to consider. It will be a place of conscious punishment for your sins and there is never a hope of relief. There is no such thing as purgatory. That does not exist. It does not exist in the Bible. It was not in the teachings of the prophets. It was not in the teachings of the apostles. It was not in the teachings of Jesus Christ. It is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. And a man leaves this earth. He either goes to heaven or hell. And wherever you end up, friend, that's where you are forever. That's it. You will not go to heaven and be cast out. And you will not go to hell and be delivered. It's over. This is your opportunity to make your choice. Many imagine that it is civilized and compassionate to deny the existence of eternal hell, to not talk to people about hell, to not warn them of the impending dangers of hell, because that's harsh and that's cruel. And why would you do something like that? Well, I believe it is compassionate and loving to do it. If I was to drive home and I saw my neighbor's house On fire, and I knew that there were people in it, and a baby was in there, and they were all in danger, and they were all sleeping in the house. I don't think it'd be very compassionate and civilized of me to just carelessly pass by the house, lest I wake them up and disturb them from their sleep and go into my house as though there's nothing to worry about. I think it would be very loving of me and compassionate of me to break down the doors if necessary and warn everybody in it to flee for your life. Well, There is a hell that people are heading to. The majority of people in this world are going there. And it's compassionate, it's loving of us that understand that and have knowledge of this destiny to warn people with all diligence of the danger that they're heading to. And to plead with them to turn and to stop heading down this road of destruction and turn to Jesus Christ that they might be saved and spared with their life. In Luke chapter 16, I told you we were going to read here. There's a passage, Jesus gives a story about a man. I don't believe this is a parable. I believe it's a literal story about two men. One goes to Abraham's bosom and the other goes to hell. And we find in this story many things that Jesus says. And I just want you to to understand some of the things that Jesus talks about. There was a certain man in verse 19, a certain rich man who habitually clothed himself in purple and fine linen and reveled in... And made merry in splendor every day. 
And at his gate there was, carelessly dropped down and left, a certain utterly destitute man named Lazarus, reduced to begging for alms and covered with ulcerated sores. He eagerly desired to be satisfied with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs even came and licked his sores. And it occurred that the man, reduced to begging, died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, or hell, the realm of the dead, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham. And I just want you to notice this. He's in torment. He has eyes. He can see. He is able to look and he can see a far distance. You just, I want you to know that. He can see a long way. He saw Abraham far away. He's able to recognize people. He recognizes Abraham. He recognizes Lazarus, the beggar who is in Abraham's bosom. And notice he cries in verse 24. And he says, Father Abraham, have pity and mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in torment in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember. So I want you to understand in hell, you still have your memory. You don't lose it. You still have that. Remember that you in your lifetime fully received what is due you in comforts and delights. And Lazarus in like manner, the discomforts and distresses. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who want to pass from this place to you may not be able and no one may pass from there to us. And the man said, then, Father, I beseech you to send him to my father's house. I have five brothers so that he may give solemn testimony and warn them, lest they too come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear and listen to them. But he answered, no, Father Abraham. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent, change their minds for the better, and hardly amend their ways in a poor in abhorrence of their past sins. And he said to him, If they do not hear and listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded and convinced and believe, even if someone should rise from the dead. Well, that someone has risen from the dead, that's Jesus, and still the majority of the world does not believe. So the words of Jesus prove true, and the words of the intellectuals prove false today. There are many people that sit around naively with audacity and they say, well, I'll give my life to Jesus if God will prove something to me. He needs to do this. He needs to work some wonder or some sign. Well, God's not fooled by your greediness. He understands that there is a way of salvation and it's not through miracles, signs and wonders that men are saved. It is through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may gain somebody's attention with a drama. I'm not against them. I think they have their place. I believe signs and wonders, miracles have their place. But I believe these things only serve as a means of getting the attention of lost men so that the gospel can be preached. And in the preaching of the gospel, the Holy Ghost moves with power and convinces sinners that they are sinners and that Jesus is the sinner's Savior. And they are saved, redeemed, born again. That's how people come. They come through the preaching of God's word. And so we have to understand this testimony. Now, Jesus gives us the description of a place of torment. I want you to understand when a man dies without Jesus Christ, he goes to what the Bible calls hell. This is a place. It is a prison. And even this prison is a place of torment. It's not your final place. But it is an intermediate place. You will go to this place called hell and you will wait there until the Bible, what it describes as the great white throne judgment of God occurs. This is after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. You will go there into a place of torment and there you will wait until the great white throne judgment. God will call you up from hell and you will go before his throne of wrath. 
and you will be judged, condemned, and then you will be sent to your second death. You not only are you sent there, but even hell itself is cast into it. And the Bible calls this place the lake of fire. And it has torment and agony and you're conscious forever and ever and ever. The Bible says that people who reject Jesus Christ are given a new body when they die. Just like those who believe in him are given a new body in order to live with God forever. Those that have rejected Jesus are given a new body. And the Bible says it is a body that is fitted for destruction. That means that the body God is going to give you is a body that is capable of somehow holding up to the flames of torment forever and ever and ever, experiencing all of its pain, all of its agony, all of its torment without being destroyed forever and ever and ever. A lot of people say, I don't understand how these bodies could last through fire like that. And so hell must not be a literal fire. Hell is a literal fire, but it's not that body that's going there. It's a new body that he's going to give you that will be able to endure it and experience all of its horrors and all of its hell. You got to understand that. I know this is absolutely horrible, but the point is God doesn't want you to go there. And the other point is, is if you know people that are headed there, You better do everything you can in your power and in the power of the Holy Ghost to rescue them from that very real place that they are going to. I want to talk to you for a minute about this. Jesus said more about hell than anyone else. He talked about it. He taught on it. He spoke of it, preached about it, warned men about it. He referred to hell as a literal place and described it in graphic terms, including raging fires and the worm that doesn't die. In the scriptures, this is what it is said of hell. They're cast into a furnace of fire. There's wailing and gnashing of teeth. They are bound hand and foot. They are taken away. They are cast into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. They are cut asunder. They're cut off. They're removed. And they're appointed with the portion of the hypocrites where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Luke says again, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And in this place of gross torment, you will see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you yourself are thrust out. I I think that that emotional torment right there is going to be absolutely horrendous. Can you imagine if you end up in hell? Can you imagine being in a place of utter darkness? You're not with your friends. You're, you're, they're, they're not around. It is not a party. It is such torment that people are biting you and chewing on you. And you're biting and chewing on other people in gross agony. And you will be able to look up and see far off the prophets of God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all in the kingdom of God, in peace, in comfort, in delight, in life, in light. And you will see that. And you will know that you passed up multitudes of opportunities to escape this torment and be where they are. Because you will have your memory. If you're lost and you go to hell, you're going to remember this day for the rest of your eternity. You're going to remember sitting in the month of May 2010 at First New Testament Church. And you were clearly warned to run to Christ And yet you refused to run to him. You wanted one more day with your sin. You wanted one more day in unbelief. Or you sat there and said, I just can't believe. Or you sat there and said, I will do it my way. I will be okay. And you will remember this moment forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And you will wonder, why didn't I take it? Why didn't I run? Why didn't I repent? Why didn't I come to Christ? And you have to understand that. You're not going to cease to exist. You're not going to be annihilated. The Bible says, Jesus said, don't fear them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You better fear God. That just simply means if an altar call is ever given and the Holy Ghost tugs at your life, And he tells you that you need to come to Jesus and you need to give him your heart. You need to give him your life. You're in sin. I'm going to have to judge you in your sin. And I don't want to. 
I want to forgive you. I want to redeem you. You need to come and you know it. If you're lost, you've experienced it. If you're saved, you remember that moment when you stood there convicted of your sin, compelled to come to Christ, and you were intimidated by what people around you thought. You were afraid. Well, I'll tell you, Jesus said, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid what they think. Don't be afraid of your friends if you become a Christian and they want nothing to do with you anymore. Jesus said, fear God because he can destroy your soul in hell. That's who you need to fear. That's what you need to respect. Again, Jesus says, they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and do iniquity and cast them into a furnace of fire. There's wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said, if your hand offends you, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than to have two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Matthew says they will be thrown outside into darkness. In the story of the rich man with Lazarus, I just I just sum this up. The wicked suffer terribly and they're fully conscious of it. They retain their desires, their memories, their reasonings, their emotions. They do not want people to suffer, but they will. They long for relief, but they find not, listen, not even a drop of water. They get nothing, no form of relief whatsoever. They cannot be comforted. They cannot leave their place of torment. And they are without any hope whatsoever. The Savior could not have painted a more bleak and graphic picture of a place of torment and punishment that people really will go to. And the duration of this place, in Jesus' own words, is eternal punishment. It is forever. That eternal is as eternal as eternal life. It just does not end. Hell will be agonizingly, agonizingly dull, small, insignificant, without purpose, without anything. As the new universe, the kingdom of God, is progressively moving onward, hell exists in utter inactivity and insignificance, an eternal non-life of regret. The scriptures say of those who die without Christ, in Thessalonians, Paul said it, they will be punished with everlasting destruction, shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of His power. Hell will have no community, no comrades, no friendship, Earth is an in-between place, an in-between world touched by both heaven and hell. Earth leads directly into heaven or it leads directly into hell. The best of life on earth is a glimpse of heaven and the worst of life on earth is a glimpse of hell. For Christians, this present life is the closest you will ever come to hell. For an unbeliever, it is the closest you will ever come to heaven. The reality of the choice that lies before us in this life is both wonderful because you can live or it is most awful because there is something worse than death. I'm always grieved when I hear of a suicide because it speaks to me of a person that could no longer deal with the pain of this life. Somehow they believed that there would be something better. But they woke it up into something extraordinarily worse, where there'll be no relief. Now think about that. Here are some of the deathbed confessions of people who did not know Jesus when they died. One of the most famous infidels of all time, a man by the name of Voltaire, he said this, I am abandoned by God and man. I shall go to hell. He lived his whole life saying it didn't exist. And at the end, he knew that's where he was going. For two months, he was tortured with such an agony as led him at times to gnash his teeth in impatient rage against God and man. And at other times, in plaintive accents, he would plead, O Christ, O Lord Jesus. And that Lord Jesus would have saved him if he just would have yielded. But he didn't. He didn't yield. He turned his face to the wall. On his last breaths, he cried out, I must die, abandoned by God and men. I must go to hell. Those were his last words. He didn't have to. 
but he chose to. One of the great colonels that we had in the founding of our country, he had a daughter. His name was Ethan Allen. His daughter was dying. She said this to her dad, who was an unbeliever. She said, you will bury me, Father, by the side of my mother, for that was her dying request. But, Father, you and mother didn't agree on religion. Mother spoke of a blessed Savior who died for all. She prayed for us to be his friend, to see him as our Savior when he sits enthroned in his glory. I can't go alone through this dark valley of death. Tell me, whom shall I follow? You or mother? Shall I reject Christ as you taught me? Or accept him as my mother did. Through tears the old soldier said, My child, cling to your mother's Savior, for she was right. I'll try to follow you to that blessed abode. They all know, all men do, even in their last moments, they know in that last moment. And if that happens to you, at least have the presence to understand, like the thief on the cross, if you just confess him as Lord. And yield to Him, even then, regardless of what you've done all of your life, you will be with Him in paradise. Isn't that a wonderful salvation? Isn't that absolutely wonderful? Charles IX, the King of France, said this on his deathbed, What blood, what murders, what evil counsels I have followed. I am lost. I see it well. I am lost. And he died. Sir Thomas Scott, the Chancellor of England, said, Until this moment, I thought there was neither God nor hell. Now I know and feel that they are both people that were standing beside him, understanding him to never believe in the afterlife, rushed to his side as they heard him saying these last words before he died. And they heard him breathe these words. I never believed in God. I never believed in hell. But now I know that there is both. And they asked him, how do you know? And he said, I feel it. The flames are already licking my feet. That's what he said. And he died. Amazing. Sir Francis Newport, oh, that I was to lie a thousand years upon the fire that never is quenched, to purchase the favor of God and be united to him again. But it is a fruitless wish. Millions of millions of years would bring me no nearer to the end of my torments than one poor hour. Oh, eternity, eternity, forever and forever. Oh, the insufferable pains of hell that I must bear. Think about that. My God, how absolutely horrible. If we understood the nature of God and we understood our fallen and corrupt nature, we would not be shocked that people had to go to hell. We would be really shocked that anybody could go to heaven. That would really be the shocking thing. It's not cruel that God would send people to hell. It's just. The amazing thing is not that humans will go there forever. The amazing thing is that they can be forgiven and go to heaven and live with God as his sons and daughters and rule and reign with Christ forever. Forever with him. That's the amazing thing that is so astounding. One man said that hell is the most single tragic tragedy in all of the universe. The greatest tragedy in all of the universe. That God would have to design a place of absolute torment, darkness and suffering in order to pay the or, or injustice, provide the punishment, the just punishment for his creature's sins that he created in his image who were created to enjoy and reflect the glories of the everlasting God, but turn their backs on him and plunge their lives into a, a life of rebellion and unbelief. And the greatest tragedy is, is in the universe is hell. I would say it's the fall of man, but it's all incorporated in the same thing. If we understand these things about hell, we cannot cross our fingers and hope for the best when we die, can we? But many people do. Even many people that sit in our churches do that. They hope. I'm here at church. Maybe it'll go well for me. I give my money. Maybe it'll go well for me. I sing in the choir. Maybe everything will be all right for me. I'm at the prayer meeting. I pray. I do these things. Maybe it will go well for me. You cannot gamble on this. Let me tell you, it is far too easy to go to hell. Every road leads to hell. Every religion leads to hell, save one. That is Jesus Christ. That is the road of redemption, the highway of holiness. It leads to God. It is a walk with God. Everything else leads leads to hell, every right thing, everything that looks right, every path that looks right is wrong. And the path that looks the most difficult is the right one. The Bible says there's a way that looks right to man. 
Many people choose it, but in the end, it leads to destruction and death. But there is a narrow way that leads to life evermore. Few there be that find it, and that is the way of life. That life is Jesus Christ. Your navigational system that is put within you at birth is set for hell. The autopilot is on. You're heading straight there. Your good works are not going to keep you out. Your pleas, your cries, your sincerities of wanting to be better is not going to keep you out. Only the blood of the Lamb washing you can take you from that destination and put you in heaven. Nothing else can. Not going to church. Nothing. Not even believing the right thing. It must be in you. Jesus said you must be born again. That is it. You must be. So don't cross your fingers and hope for the best. In Revelation chapter 21, you can study it. You find that this deals with the great white throne judgment of God. And God is going to bring men from the dead. And he is going to have them appear before his throne. And the Bible says that the books are open. And so all these books are open. I assume these are the book of works. Just like we as Christians are going to be judged for our works, so the lost and the damned are going to also be judged according to their works. Jesus said it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you in the day of judgment, because Sodom and Gomorrah had the presence of Abraham and Lot, but you have Jesus walking among you. So you've been given more, you're required of more. So they're going to be open. These are the books of works. No man is going to be sent to hell or to the lake of fire by his works. If you will notice in a careful study of Revelation 21, everyone that is sent to the lake of fire is sent there for this reason. Your name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the only reason you're going there. Now, you may be judged more accordingly to your behavior and your works on this earth, but the only reason you go to hell is if your name is absent from the Lamb's book of life. You are not going to heaven because you work for it. Nobody's going to stand around the throne of God and say, look at me, look what I've done, look how hard I work, sacrifices I've made, how holy I've become. Nobody's going to do that. The only way they get into the kingdom of God is because their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Well, whose name gets written there? Only those that believe. That's it. Belief. Belief in Jesus Christ is the way your name gets written in the Lamb's book of life. Well, you talk about this to many religions, and they'll practically crucify you for it, because there are people who are determined to work to get to heaven. They're determined to do it, and you say it's by faith alone. The just shall live by faith, and I'll tell you, you will be persecuted, you will be slandered, you will be killed for that belief, because it is the devil that hates that truth. And that is the saving truth. Jesus said that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. That is Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. You read that. Study it. This is your life. Don't gamble. Don't cross your fingers. Hope you make it to heaven when you die. You better know. You better know where you are and where you're going. And Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21, you read, read around that. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does that tell us other than this? That there are a lot of people who surround the things of God, who confess him as Lord, but he is not their Lord. We were singing this song. You know, you are my king. You are my king. Jesus, you are my king. He is our Lord. One way that you know he is your Lord is not because you're perfected and not because you never fall. But because there are things you are not doing today, you would be doing because Jesus is your king. He is your king. And you know, if he wasn't your king, you wouldn't be here today and you would be drunk. You would be in sin. You would be in adultery. You would be in pornography. And the reason you're not given to it, not that you're never tempted with it, but the reason you're not given to it, even though you might be tempted with it, is because Jesus Christ is your Lord. He is your Lord. Now, in Matthew 7, verse 21 These people answer Jesus and they tell him. Now, this is what they say. But Lord, in your name, 
So they understood his authority. They understood he was the Lord. And they took noble action. They said, in your name, we've cast out devils. In your name, we've prophesied. In your name, we've done many wonderful things. But Jesus said, I will respond to them and I will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, because I never knew you. Never. He never knew them. They never had a relationship. They weren't saved at one time and lost it. He never knew them. There was never a relationship. He didn't say, well, we used to know each other and we don't now. Or you used to be with me and you turned back. He said, we never knew each other. Now, obviously, Jesus in Matthew 7 is referring to religious people. We know that there are people in the world that are lost. We know that they have no knowledge of God. They have no desire for Jesus. They have no saving confession in their life whatsoever. But one of the most horrific things imaginable is people sitting in here, people sitting in our churches, Christian people sitting in evangelical churches who think they're going to go to heaven when they die and wake up in eternity, not with God. And Jesus says, depart from me, bind them hand and foot, cast them into outer darkness where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth and a furnace of fire that never goes out where the worm never dies because I never knew you. And notice how they try to come to God. Notice what they try to present. They present a religion of works. Look what we've done. Certainly we've earned the right to be here. And Jesus said, that's iniquity. That is for you to insinuate that my death was not enough. And through works of your own, you could earn heaven is to offend the highest height of my holiness and my justice. You could never earn your way here. And to try to think that you could is to insult my death, my resurrection. It is to insult it to the very core. And they never knew him. Do not merely assume that you're a Christian and that you're going to heaven. Make the conscious decision to accept Jesus' sacrificial death on your behalf. When you choose to accept Christ and surrender your control, the control of your life to him, You can be certain that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life because he said it. And that's how you live now. You live by faith. How do you know you're saved? He said it. He said, I'm going to talk to you about that in just a moment. Jesus said to the religious and Paul also said to the religious. Paul said it to the Corinthians. He dealt with it to those in Galatia. Now, listen, he's crying out to his churches. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. In the book of Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs 30. I'm not certain. But anyway, there's a proverb that says there is a generation that has washed their hands in vain. For their iniquities are still with them. The only way your iniquities can be removed is to be washed by Jesus. That's the only way. That is it. When you notice these things, it's not that somebody got drunk. It's not that somebody looked at pornography. It's not that somebody stole. It's not that somebody lied. I don't have time today to go into all of these scriptures, but we will. But in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 and and in the other passages and in the book of Revelation, it doesn't say if you got drunk, you're going to hell. Or if you murdered somebody, you're going to hell. Or if you lied, you're going to hell. But it said, the murderer, the drunkard, the thief. It's not what they do, it's what they are. It's the habitual pattern of their heart and their life. There's no fight in them. You've got to understand that because of what I'm about to say. How do you know? How do you know? You wrestle with temptation. You wrestle with sin like any lost person does. You wrestle with it. You're tempted because you still have your flesh. You still have your old man. Well, I want you to notice this in 1 John chapter 5. What the apostle tells us in 1 John 5 verse 13. I want you to see this. Well, we're going to back up to verse 10. It says, he who believes in the Son of God 
who adheres to, trust in, relies on Him, has the testimony, possesses this divine attestation within Himself. He who does not believe God has made Him out to be and represented Him as a liar because He has not believed, put His faith in, adhered to and relied on the evidence, the testimony that God has borne regarding His Son. Don't let anybody ever tell you, well, I just can't believe. I want to, I just can't. That is the biggest lie. And they're making God out to be a liar. The truth is, a person doesn't because they choose not to. Unbelief is not a disease. Unbelief is not something that just simply happens. Unbelief is a sin. It is the refusal to acknowledge the testimony of God and confess and rely upon the fact that it's true. That's unbelief. And that's what we must be given. In verse 11, and this is that testimony, that evidence, God gave us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who possesses the Son has that life. And he who does not possess the Son of God does not have that life. I write this to you who believe in, adhere to, trust in, rely on, The name of the Son of God in the peculiar services and blessings conferred on him on men so that you may know with settled and absolute knowledge that you already have life. Yes, eternal life. And so John, in other words, says, I'm writing this so that you will know that you have eternal life. And the way that you know you have eternal life is because you have the Son. If you have the Son, you have life. Now, there are people who would say, well, you've got to speak in tongues. You've got to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You've got to be this. You've got to be that. Let people say what they want to say. Don't make it more difficult than it is. If you have the Son... You have eternal life. Because the Son is eternal life. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. And it's not as though I were God and I would say to Buddy, look, you're dying, you're going to hell, you're dead. I have eternal life. Buddy, here it is. It's a gift for you. Come and take it. And it's an exchange where I give him some. That's not. It is the gift of God. It is not that God hands something over to him and now says, now here's that life. Go and and make the best of it. It is God giving himself to Buddy, stepping into Buddy. And he is made alive because God, who is eternal life, has now taken up his home inside the man who was once dead. And now he's alive. How is he alive? God stepped into him. I can no more explain being born again than I could explain intricate things of physics or anything. I can't. And it's even beyond that. The only thing I know is, is that the Spirit of God steps into a dead man and makes him alive. How do you know you're alive? You're alive. How do you know you're alive right now? Because you're alive. You're alive. And and everybody around you knows you're alive or we'd be putting you in a coffin and burying you. And if we put you in a coffin and and dug a six foot deep hole and we're about to put you in it, you would testify against it. Don't. I'm alive. You know, and we say, well, how do you know you're alive? I know I'm alive. You know, well, spiritually, how do you know you're alive? Because you're alive. That's how you know. You see, you hear, you feel, you taste, you touch, you experience. This is life, guys. This is not... Just some hollow confession, just a a set of dogmas and says, this is the truth. Just believe it. Yes, you must believe it. But the Bible says that belief gets inside of you. I don't know how that happens, but he does it. He puts it in you. He puts his life in you. Peter says you are partakers of the divine nature of God. The divine nature. So what does that mean? It means by nature. Something in nature happens to you. This is what separates 
true Christianity from religion because religion is to be obsessed with your outward behavior and the conforming of your outward man to the proper behavior patterns of what we think God wants us to be. And we strive to do that. But Christianity is not the obsession of our outward man to conform, but it is the faith of the transformation of our inward life for God to change our hearts and our desires and our will and everything. It's not to just not lose my temper, but it's to have a battle inside of me where there's something now in me that doesn't want to. And I want to talk about this for just a minute, the assurance of salvation and knowing that you are saved. We can know for sure that we have eternal life. John just said that. I write this that you might know it. We can know for sure that we're going to heaven and we're not going to hell. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to go to your deathbed hoping, oh my God, I hope I made it. You, don't ha- you can know. You can know of, of an absolute surety. For those who know Christ, their place is heaven. For those who don't, their place is hell. Jesus and heaven are the ones we thirst for. Jesus and heaven are offered to us at no cost because he already paid the price for us. I would to God that there was a preacher at Voltaire's deathbed. I would to God there was a preacher at some of these people we read at their deathbed where they were about to expire. And they were consumed with the fact that they're going to hell, rejected of God and men. When the whole time God would have pleaded to them, I don't want to reject you, not even now, not even what you've done to me, not even that you made it your life's ambition to deny and to refute that a hell exists and that God exists, not even that you spent your whole life trying to attack me and everyone who believed in me and persecuted me. Even now, I would accept you if you would call upon me to save you, even if he would have done that to anybody. He would have done it for Hitler. He would have done it for anybody. He would do it for you. He'd do it for me. Because there's nobody good or better or worse than anybody else. Nobody. We're all the same. We're all the same. It's the same flesh. It's the same dirt. It's the same rebellion. It's the same sin. The same wickedness. It doesn't matter to the extent you've allowed it to flare up and it doesn't matter to the religious pressure that you have have caused it to be restrained. It doesn't matter. It's all there. And God sees all of that. And he says, I want to accept you. I don't want to reject you. And all you have to do is believe the price has been paid. That man who said all that I could lay upon the flames of an unquenchable fire for a thousand years, that it might purchase me the favor of God and redemption from this place, but it won't. A million years upon this flame will be no different than an hour upon this flame, and I'll be no nearer to heaven, no nearer to God. And the wonderful thing is you don't have to live upon that flame for one second. You don't ever have to feel it. Because he tasted it. Jesus tasted it all. He bit the whole thing. He swallowed all of death. He swallowed it. He took it all in. All of the wrath of God. All of the judgment of God. All of his torment. All of the pain. All of the sin. All of the dark. He took it all in. And you don't even ever have to taste it, touch it, experience it at all. If this earth is the closest we come to hell, hallelujah. Praise God, because even now he's with us. Even now he is with us. And I'll tell you, I need him. I do. I I need him. It's been a tough year. Many trials, many afflictions, many temptations. And I need him. I need him to walk close with me. I need him. If I ever need him to hold me in his hand, I need him to hold me in his hand. I'm glad I'm not holding on. I'm glad I'm not saying, oh, I'm going to make it another day. I'm held According to the prophets, by the everlasting arms, they never get tired. They never get tired. I'm in the palm of his hand. What power in heaven and earth and all of creation can open that hand and get me out? What power? He said that. Nothing can pluck you out of my hand. I know what things have gone off in your heads about eternal security. I'm not getting into all of that today. I don't want to take away from the simplicity. And Jesus said, no man, nothing can pluck you out of my hand. Can we just be suffice with that this morning? (laughs) 
I'm not getting into all of that this morning. Can you run out of his hand? Can you leave it? We'll talk about that later. But I just know what he said. I'm in his hand. I have no decision to leave it. I have no desire to run from it. This is my refuge. This is my hope. And there's no devil in hell. And there's no power on earth that can come and get me out. This is where I have to be. All right? And because of that, yeah, you better believe it. I've got eternal security. If that's my confession, my belief, my faith, I'm secure. I, be, I believe in that. I don't believe. Listen, don't transform Christianity into this garbage you hear everywhere else with every other religion. Oh, I don't know if Allah is going to accept me today or not. John said you can know that you have eternal life. Well, don't tell me you know today and you don't tomorrow. You can know. All right? You can know. I'm going to get a lot of phone calls, a lot of counseling coming up. But bring it on. We'll do it. We'll do it. I'm, no, I'm not avoiding that issue. I don't want to confuse it. This is so very important because you are made for a place and a person. Jesus is the person and the place is his heaven. His presence, wherever he is. There's a simple way of going to heaven. And there's a simple way to know that you're there. It's very simple. The simplicity of it is this, and I'm going to just give you things from the Scriptures. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, let somebody come argue with you about that. Let somebody come and say, well, I want to see this and I want to see this and I want to see this out of you. And let a thousand people come and judge you. And confuse you and cause your faith to waver. But as for me, that's what he said. In Romans chapter 10, that's what he said. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. By God, I'm going to call on that name. And that name is Jesus. Peter said, there is no other name given among men whereby men must be saved than the name of Jesus. That is the name I'm going to call. Jesus, save me. Save me from what? And you know what? If I just begin this relationship with him of salvation, he's going to show me everything I need to be saved from. There are going to be things he touches in my life. You need to be saved from this. You need to be saved from this. And he's going to show me. You need to be saved from hell. You need to be saved from my judgment. You need to be saved from my wrath. You ask me to come save you, son, I'm coming to save you. I'm not just coming to save you from this. I'm not coming to just save you from this sin. I'm coming to save you from all of it. And I'm going to talk to you about it. And I'm going to convict you of it. And as long as I'm agreeing with him, and he's saving me. He's saving me. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you believe he's the son of God, you believe he died for your sins, you believe he died and was buried and rose again the third day. If you believe that in your heart, And confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. That's what he said. Romans chapter 10, that's what he said. Jesus said, you must be born again. Nicodemus asked the question that all of us would have asked. How? You tell me how and I'll do it. The Spirit blows where it listeth. Meaning the Holy Spirit goes wherever he goes. Well, I understand. The only way a man can be born again is by the Holy Ghost, and he moves. So where does he move? He must move upon those who call. I can't make myself born again, God, I'm dead. But if you said that I must be born again, then make me born again, whatever that means. Make me. I don't understand it. I can't comprehend it. But you said I had to be. You're my Lord. I believe your words. I want to be. Make me born again. It is the simplicity of faith. A living faith. Not a dead faith. But a living faith. You believe in Jesus Christ. You put your faith in him from your heart. You rely upon him. Hebrews says he is your refuge. He is your hope. Don't give up then. If he is your refuge, and I'm talking about assurance now, and he is your hope, 
then don't look at yourself, your temptations, your failures, your sins. Keep getting up. Keep moving forward. Keep confessing. Keep believing. Keep trusting. Because he's your, if your hope is the fact that you're going to overcome this, you have transferred your hope from him to something else. He is your hope. Keep him as your hope. That doesn't mean you're going to continue in your sin, because if he's your hope, he's going to deliver you from it. But keep your eyes on Jesus. He is your hope. He is your refuge. I have no other one. You'll say to God, not like the other people did, that, Lord, we, I did so many great things in the church. I went on mission trips, and I helped missionaries go into the world, and I taught a Bible study at work. I mean, surely you've got to let me into heaven because of this. But if in your heart, just because you hear me say it, it's not a phrase that God's going to be fooled by it. But if you believe in your heart, really in your heart, and you can stand before God and you can say with all faith and confidence, Father, I am here because of the blood of your Son. I am here Because I have no other hope but Him. And I fully believe that you are satisfied in His redemption for my sin. I really believe that. I really believe that, God. And now you've come inside of me. And you, by your presence, have given me eternal life. I love you. I'm not in the discipline of religion now. I'm in the liberty of the Spirit, which out of love now, I want to please you. I want to. So, assurance of salvation, there's a conflict in your life. There's a conflict. How do you know? Because there's a battle going on inside of you. Not after you sin. The lost have that. But before, you wrestle with it. You wrestle with temptation. According to Ephesians 2 and according to the average testimony, that before a person ever knew Jesus Christ, there wasn't a battle with sin. We just did it. We did, that's what everybody does. You just try to be a little bit better than anybody else or as good as everybody else. Try not to do the really bad things, murder and all of that. But as far as everything else, you know, we just... We didn't battle with it. We just drank. We just did it. And now the temptation comes, whatever that temptation is for you. And immediately there's this God who now lives inside of you. And now there's this old nature who still wants all of that as badly as it ever did. It hasn't changed at all. It never will. But now there's a God, the Lord Jesus, by a spirit who lives inside of you. And when those things begin to come and your flesh gets excited and wants it, that God just begins to speak to that new life. No. Don't give yourself to it. Don't yield to it. Don't take it. Don't walk it. And now there's this, oh my God, there's this conflict in me. It's because you're saved. You didn't have it when you were lost, but you have it now because you're saved. And then there's discipline. Because if you ignore that and you go on with your sin, then that God now disciplines you. He chastens you. He corrects you. He teaches you. Why? Because you're his. Before, you just felt bad. You were frustrated. You spent all the money on that. Frustrated about this. Angry about that. But now he's teaching you. And there's a desire in his instruction for righteousness and true holiness. There's the desire. And that battle rages because you have two natures. If you don't have two natures, you have no battle. But now you have those two natures. And then you have the witness of the Holy Spirit. According to Romans chapter 8, he lives inside of you and he proclaims within your spirit that you are 
the child of God. He proclaims it to you. You are a child of God. And all of that is taken by faith. It's taken by faith, and faith takes hold until it's a reality. Predominantly, Ethan would come to us all the time, wanting assurance of his salvation. As a parent, you know, you want to say, baby, you're saved. You have a confession of Christ. You believe in him. You know you're all right. But I never could do that. I would always tell him, you need to go pray until the Holy Ghost comes to you and tells you, you are his. How is he going to do that? Read his word. We'd give him scriptures to read. Read his word. This is what God says. Baby, this is what God said you have to do to be saved. You have to confess Him. You have to believe on Him. You have to be born again. Go open these scriptures up. Lay it before God and say, God, I want to be born again. Lord Jesus, I call upon you to save me. Oh God, I believe with all of my heart. If my heart doesn't all believe it, then make my heart believe it all that Jesus is your Son, died for me on the cross, rose again on the third day, and is my Savior. I want this God. Let me, help me do everything in me, and then come in the power of the Holy Ghost and you, God, tell me and let me know I'm yours. And one day he walked in and I knew God just spoke to him. And he knew. And you can know. You can know. I want you to stand with me. I want you to hear this. We read the Deathbed experiences of unbelievers. Here's some of believers. Paul said, Oh, death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, just before he died, could see all the way into heaven. Just before he died, he saw the glory of God. He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I don't think the stones killed him. I think God just took him. Oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Paul said, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. The author of the hymn, Rock of Ages, said, just as he was dying, Oh, what delights! Who can fathom the joys of this third heaven? What a bright sunshine is enveloping around me. I don't have words to express it. I know it can't be long now. And bursting, they said, as he was going into the other world, he cried, Oh, the glories of God. Oh, my soul, the glories of God. All is light, 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 the brightness of his own glory. Here I come, Lord Jesus. Matthew Henry, the great theologian, said, You have been used to take notice of the sayings of dying men. This is mine. That a life spent in the service of God and communion with Him is the most comfortable and pleasant life that one can live in this present world. John Wesley said, Best of all is this, God is with us. They were asking Him how He was doing, how He felt. And He said, Oh, the best of all, He is with me. We thank Thee, O Lord, for these and all Your mercies. Bless Your church. Clouds drop fatness. The Lord is with me. The God of Jacob is my refuge. And he died. Christians of various ranks and people said, I shall soon be with Jesus. Am I too anxious? I'm so ready to go. Can this be death? It's better than living. Tell him I have no pain and I'm happy in Jesus. One on his deathbed just began to cry as he said, Oh my God, how beautiful as the heavens open. 
Another said, glory to God, I see the heavens open before me. And what shall I say? And he said to his family, it is true. If you could just see him as I do, Christ is altogether lovely. His glorious angels are now here. They've come for me. I'm not afraid of death and I'm done with darkness forever. I see Jesus. I want to go and be with him. Don't weep for me. I'm going home. Another said eternity is rolling up before me like a sea of glory. It's so near. The sun is setting, but mine has just risen. He just rose from his throne. Farewell, my family. William Wilberforce said, my affections are so much in heaven that I can leave you without a regret. I do not love you less. I just love God more. Samuel Rutherford said, my eyes shall see my Redeemer He has pardoned, loved, and washed me and given me joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm feeding on manna that I've tasted all of my life. Glory, glory, glory to my Creator, my Redeemer forever. Glory, glory is shining in Emmanuel's land. David Brainerd, the great missionary in North America, said, I am going into eternity and it is sweet to me to think of eternity. The endlessness of it makes it sweet. But oh, what shall I say of the eternity of the wicked? The thought is too dreadful. John Antler said, the chariot has come. I'm stepping in now. John Lyth said, this is not death. It is life. How bright the room, how full of angels. And the last one. The Apostle Paul again, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation has the power to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, my Lord, my Lord. Do you know this morning? Are you crossing your fingers and hoping? Are you religious? Are you trying to bring to God something of yourself? Or do you bring nothing but the blood of the Lamb? You young people, are you really saved? Are you really born again? Those of you that have sat in this church, maybe you've been here for 20 years. But you don't have the assurance. Why not have it? Why not get it? Do what we told our son. Open the word up. That's what God said. Take him at his word. Beg him to do it for you. And he will. And you can know. And how stupid could anybody be to play around with their eternity? How stupid could it be to hope you make it when you can know? And if you reject, you will remember this day As you burn in that fire forever. I had my chance. I had my chance.